Hello, everybody. Oh, claps, yeah, claps. That's good, that's good. <laughs> I refused to drink water before this presentation because I thought, well, if I wet my pants, I don't want that to go viral. We don't want that all over the place. <laughs> so designing the new industrials, maybe I know what that means? I don't. Uh, it's pretty crazy, a bunch of fancy words up there. You have to have a good title, right? So, uh, you know, it's interesting how technology grows. It's always around us. It's constantly becoming better. Moore's Law tells us this. It's a, technology will continue to advance and advance. And I'm a huge fan of gizmos, electronics. I'm always interested in the next big phone that's coming out and whatnot. But today, I don't really want to talk about that. I want to talk about how those pieces of technology are changing us. But you and I, of course, but culturally, society, societally, how it's going to change what we do. And, Chris Bangle, the former head of design at BMW, got me super fascinated with this topic, and since then I haven't been able to keep my mind off of it. So this picture right here is a bunch of Greek pottery, okay? Ancient Greek pottery. It's found where modern day Britain is today, but it's ancient Greek pottery. I want you to look at it and, and notice the difference, the variety. Look how uh, intricate each piece is. And remember, these pieces when they were created by the Greeks way back when, they weren't supposed to be in a museum. They were tools. It was a utilitarian item. It was going to be a clay pot to carry food, to carry water. Uh, they didn't really, oh, okay, you know, hey, I want this to be you know, in a TEDx talk you know, a hundred, couple hundred years from now. So we have that. And this is what our pots look like today, okay? So our pots and pans is from Walmart right up the road. Notice that there's no personality, there's no character, there's no individual craftsmanship in it, right? All these pots and pans are created with science and engineering. They said, okay, well, hey, we're going to create this pot and pan. It's going to be, um, you know, it has to be this big, it has to be uh, this light, and we're going to get it to where it's the least amount of material possible. And then they took a focus group, and the focus group sat down, and they said, okay, well, we need to pick a color for this. Now, okay, well, we found out this shade of red is popular in all 30 countries that we're going to sell it in, and we can sell it to men and women, so that's good. And it matches like 68% of the kitchen designs out there, so this, this is the color we're going to choose, right? Now, that's not a lot of personality. That's not a lot of culture. You know, maybe a couple hundred years from now when they dig these up, they'll probably be like, wow, this Teflon stuff, this is good. But they might also think, wow, these guys are pretty boring. People in Japan and America, all over the place, they had these exact same pans. You could call it globalization, but really what happened was we became an industrial world. And we started with this handcrafted world where things are made. There's a, a, an element of craftsmanship to it and a, a lot of pride and personality that came out. And then we said, oh, we have to lower the cost. We have to increase the profit margins. What are we doing? That's, this is the whole goal. And so what ends up happening is we end up in this industrial world, which is where we're now. You know, And it's not a bad thing. I love this industrial world we live in. There's low cost. There's quite a wide variety of things you can buy now. And it's constantly pushing innovation because we're all competing with each other. That's cool. But what we gave up was this, this whole world that we had, this culture, this, this individual contribution from each one of us and everybody creating things. We lost all of that. Because we said, no, the big company will handle it. You know, I'll let Apple make my watch before I actually go out and make my own. That was the last 100 years. Here we are now. This is 2015. This is a 3D printer. You can print things in 3D. Mind blown, right? Crazy. I got to see one of these for the first time this year, and I just I couldn't. I was like, I could print anything. I could do anything. Think about what I could print. It's insane. And right now, this is about $1,000. You want to put one of these in your homes? You can. In the future, it'll be much less expensive. You'll be able to put it right next to your color printer. And you know, your color printer will still run out of ink after like six pages, but you'll have a 3D printer, which will be really awesome. That's the whole point. Um, and these 3D printers and fabrication technologies, laser cutters, end mills, lathes, CNC equipment, things that are used to build things are actually pretty expensive still. You know, the price is coming down very soon, very quickly, and that's why in the near future it's very exciting for all of us. But right now, they're in the intermediate phase, you know, kind of when GPS had to come down to us and cell phones had to come down to us, oh, it has to come down to us. Well, right now, this technology, this digital fabrication technology is coming down towards us, but right now, it's not there yet. And it's in these spaces called maker spaces, called fab labs. This is a picture of our fab lab here at UTA. 
This is a map of all the fab labs around the world, but there are maker spaces, hacker spaces, they're popping up everywhere. They're gonna be everywhere. And the idea is you can come in, you can learn the technology, you can figure it out. You don't have to be an engineer, you don't have to be a designer to say, I wanna build something, I wanna make something, I wanna add an armrest between me and the guy next to me, right, all you guys? You know, that, that's the whole point of these spaces. And in that way, they're designing what is gonna be the new industrialism, what our world is gonna look like. So we're going from this handcrafted world to this industrial world. That's where, you know, it was the last hundred, couple hundred years, right? And now we're gonna have this new industrialism, and that's what these spaces are helping create for us right now. It's very exciting, and you get to make your own items or whatever you want. And we're gonna get the benefits from the cultural side of things, this handcrafted world that we were part of. And then we're also gonna have the low cost benefits and the variety and the innovation that we get from the industrial world. So this is, this is a win-win. Uh, this is not bad at all, I love this. And it's already happening. These are some items that are being made at Fab Labs across the world right now, prosthetic legs, uh, the, the, the guitar up there. I just made that decal real quick, the TEDx UTA 2015 decal. It took me like five minutes, right? I mean, think about this. We can build anything we want. And a lot of people come up to me and they're like, okay, mate, I hear your argument. This is cool, okay, great, but you know, I really don't care. I just wanna go out and you know, buy a phone case. Is that that difficult? You're right. And if you go to Walmart, there's thousands of phone cases on the shelves. You can buy any color, uh, you know, all kinds of different styles. Some protect your phone, some are just stylish. But when you go through all these different phone cases, you always bring one back and you're like, okay, this is my phone case now. But what is it about that phone case that we still have to customize, that we still have to put a sticker on, that we still have to put a charm on? Why do we have to put keychains on our car keys? Why do we have to do these things? Is it because we want to express who we are? Is that it? That's really it. We're trying to get our creativity out there. We're trying to unleash it. And for many, many years, it's kind of been restricted because we didn't have the technology to allow us to build it. And we didn't have a way to create it. We had no means of doing it. But the time is here, and it's now. So this is Evan right now. He's uh, eight years old. He uh, has his own YouTube channel. Him and his dad make toy reviews, okay? Pretty awesome, right? He clears $1.3 million every year. Isn't that incredible? That's insane, right? Uh, what am I doing here in college? <laughs> you know, I could be doing that. Uh, he's got his own line of apparel. It's fantastic. Uh, but the point here is not that Evan is a YouTube star. There are many YouTube stars. But Evan and his dad decided to utilize the technology around them the internet, their camera, and instead of just having those videos go in a box on the shelf for the wedding that Evan was gonna have in 20 years, we pull out and I'll laugh at him, they started putting them up online. And th the thing is, there was no network company that was ever gonna say, oh hey, Evan, come over here, yeah, we wanna give you a TV show, you like this, okay, let's do this. That wasn't gonna happen. And the crazy thing is Toys R Us has a YouTube channel too, and they're not even close in followers and subscribers. All their videos combined probably have, you know, maybe, the same number of views as one of Evan's videos, right? He's empowered himself, he's utilized the technology around him. Now what if you could build a prosthetic hand, right? That was better than everybody else's and cheaper. You know, wouldn't that be awesome? Well this guy, age 19, East Stillman Chapel, he did it. He built his own prosthetic hand. He met a girl, she needed a prosthetic hand, it was $80,000, he thought, well that's kind of absurd. Maybe I can build it for less money. And he did, he built it for $350. And it's better in many, many ways. He utilized digital fabrication techniques. He went and found out, oh, that's how I do 3D printing, this is how I do programming. He learned it and he's empowered himself and he's changing not only his world but others around him. He's really shaping the world he's gonna live in. He's giving a TEDx talk, he's super famous and fancy and smart, it's amazing stuff. Now, when you think about what he did, and he spent all this time developing this hand and all the millions of dollars that the companies spend developing their hands, right? The medical companies spend all this time developing uh, prosthetic hands, billions of dollars in R&D, and then you know, here's Easton you know, in Colorado, he's just developing his own hand. So is that gonna change how our businesses work? And it is. This is a company, Local Motors, a really cool car company. They crowdsource their designs. It's that simple. They just go out and oh, okay, here's a competition. We want to design an off-road vehicle. All you guys submit designs, right? So the guy who won this design to have his car built, Sang Ho Kim, when asked, oh, hey, how long have you been designing cars? So only just about four years. I didn't really think I was ever going to be a car designer, but hey, look at that. He's got a car now, right? You can see this at the Perot Museum here in Dallas. It's on display. So, this idea that a company, now, they're not spending all this money, they're getting all the marketing benefits from it, and guess what? They're empowering all of us. All of us have a say in it all of a sudden. And that's important, that's a, a cultural 
thing for us to be able to say, oh, wow, look, my voice is in it. All of us are involved in it. That's really important. That's the point of this talk is if we can get our voices out there and if we can unleash our creativity to create our ideas, how can we change our own worlds for the better? So with that, I'll leave you with this quote. Design creates culture. Culture shapes values. Values determine the future. Thank you. Thank you.